The color and paramagnetism of complex ions and coordination compounds is going to be the topic of this lesson. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description below for where you can find those courses. Now, this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist, which is just about finished. But if you'd still like to be notified every time I post these last few lessons, then subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. So let's start with color here, and it turns out that complex ions and coordination compounds are very often associated with very bright, vivid colors. So, and not all of them, but the vast majority that you come across, you know, usually we, we associate these transition metals and transition metal complexes with these bright colors. And there's a, a very good reason for that. Now, you've got to understand kind of the nature of color in a compound, and what's really going on here is you're going to have an orbital, and it's got to have an electron in it here down here, a low energy orbital, and then you're going to have a higher energy orbital. So, and it turns out when you absorb light of just the right energy, you might end up promoting an electron from this lower energy orbital to this higher energy orbital. Well, it turns out that the energy of that light is going to correspond perfectly to this gap in energy between these two orbitals. Well, if you take a look at, say, the oxygen in this room. Well, the oxygen in this room, I say take a look at it, but it's invisible, and it's invisible for a reason. If you look at the highest energy orbital that has electrons and oxygen, and then the lowest energy orbital above that, the gap is huge. And it's so huge that the energy difference corresponds to the energy of ultraviolet light, which your eyes and my eyes cannot see, which is why we can't see uh, oxygen in this case. So if a compound is going to appear colored, then it needs to absorb light that you and I can see. And that's colored light, visible light. It needs to absorb light in the visible spectrum. And unfortunately, again, this gap compared to oxygen is going to have to come down in a significant way. That gap is just too big in, say, oxygen and things of this sort. Well, it turns out, comparatively speaking then, if you take a look at the gaps in energy in the d orbital splitting, whether that be in an octahedral complex, whether it be low spin or high spin, in a tetrahedral complex, or in a square planar complex, if you look at some of these d orbital splittings, that energy gap is much smaller than the one I just referenced in, say, oxygen or something like this. Uh, and as a result, it often corresponds to visible light. And so visible light might get absorbed. Now, one thing you have to realize, though, is that even though a certain color of visible light is going to get maximally absorbed, that's not the color it's actually going to appear to you and I. There's something called the color wheel. And if you absorb, say, uh, you know, red light. Well, red light is on one side of the color wheel, and if you're absorbing that red light, then you're going to reflect back most of everything else. And the average of everything else would be on the opposite side of what we call the color wheel, and I'll put it up on the board here. An opposite of red typically is something going to be more in the green spectrum. So if it absorbs red light, it's probably going to appear green in color to you and I. And so I just want to make sure you realize that the color it appears to your eyes and the color of light that's actually being absorbed are not the same color. We call them complementary colors and they're on opposite sides of that color wheel. And so uh, we will probably exclusively talk about the color of light being absorbed, not the color of light at which it appears to your eye. And I just want to make sure you realize that distinction here. So, all right. So it turns out a larger gap in energy in these d orbital splittings is probably going to be shifted towards the violet end of the spectrum, the highest energy visible light, and the smaller gaps will be shifted towards the red end, uh, red end of the spectrum. And I say violet, but most of the time we just actually kind of call one end of the spectrum red and the other one blue, which notice it goes blue, indigo, violet. So we really should call it the violet end of the spectrum, but for whatever reason, we often refer to red shifted and blue shifted, to, you know, depending on which end of the spectrum it's shifted towards and things of a sort. So just keep that in mind. So, but larger gaps uh, absorbing light more towards the blue blue-violet region, so, and then smaller gaps in energy between the d-orbital splittings are going to be absorbing light closer to the red end of the spectrum. All right, so we may not know the exact color, but at least we might be able to comparatively say it's more one way versus another, more towards the red or more towards the blue-violet, if you will. Okay, so the way this works then, requirement for being colored then, so is you got to be one of these d-orbital complexes, and it doesn't matter if you're octahedral, tetrahedral, or square planar, but the key is you have to have an electron down in one of the lower sets, and then you have to have an empty place for it to go, one of these four spots in the octahedral or one of these six spots in the tetrahedral, and the square planar is a little bit special if you recall. For a square planar, they only exist for d8, so these are always going to have eight electrons. And so square planar, we expect them to be colored all the time because they're always going to have a, at least one electron, in this case eight electrons, down here in one of these lower sets, and they're always going to have an empty spot. In this case, it's got two empty spots in that highest energy orbital in the d orbital splittings. And so for a square planar complex, yes, we expect them to be colored. Now for octahedral, so 
here with one electron in the d orbital, yeah, I've got a, an energy in, uh, an electron in one of these low energy orbitals, and I've got four empty spots up here to which it could go to, and so if it absorbs light of just this energy difference, this same energy as the crystal field splitting energy, well, then it's going to absorb visible light in all likelihood and appear colored to the naked eye. So when would we expect maybe an octahedral or tetrahedral complex not to be colored? Well, I'll give you an example. So if you have a metal ion that is d0, no d electrons, well then there's no electrons down here or here, and as a result, you don't have any electrons that could get promoted up to the higher set of d orbitals. So if you're d0, no guarantee you're gonna be colored. We don't necessarily expect you to be colored. So other side of the coin is going to be D10. And so D10, whether you fill it in low spin or high spin, and in this case, I'll do it with the octahedral here, and, and then the tetrahedral here. And notice in either case, I do have electrons now down in these lower energy sets of orbitals, but I don't have a place for it to get promoted in the upper set because they're full as well. And so for D10, no reason it should be absorbing light corresponding to the crystal field splitting energy, no reason we'd expect it to be colored. Now it could be colored for other reasons. It turns out this d orbital splitting is not the only reason so that compounds can be colored. And if you take organic chemistry, you'll learn about pi electrons and things of this sort. So however, in this chapter, this is the principal reason why things might appear to be colored. And so if you have D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, we should expect that compound to be colored. Is it guaranteed? No. Is it pretty likely? Yes. But if you're D0 or D10, we probably are going to expect it to be colorless and not be colored. Is that guaranteed? Well, no. But again, it's just part of the trend. Really high likelihood that something with no D electrons or 10 D electrons is going to end up being colorless. All right. So that's color. Now we've got to talk about what we refer to as paramagnetism and diamagnetism. Empty these out a little bit. And so these are going to be different than ferromagnetism, kind of the magnetism we associate with iron. So, and that deals with, you know, little uh, areas of iron where you've got spins kind of aligned and things of this sort. And, uh, and I'm not going to go there, but this is related to spin, but it's going to be the spins typically of unpaired electrons. So it turns out electrons have a spin associated with them. So, and we like to say either spin up or spin down, and that's when we write electrons, you know, we like to represent that with an up arrow or a down arrow. But there are two opposite spins, so the, and they are exactly opposite in magnitude as well. And so it turns out when you pair up electrons, their spins cancel each other out. And so to have an overall spin associated with an atom here, you've got to have unpaired electrons. And it turns out that leads to a, a state we call paramagnetism. We say that that substance is paramagnetic. And that's the, that's the requirement. You just got to have unpaired electrons. And it turns out the more unpaired electrons you have, the more paramagnetic it becomes. Well, what does this ultimately mean in terms of magnetism? Well, it means that if you have one of these lovely complexes uh, or metal ions or, or whatever moving through a magnetic field, it's going to experience a slight attraction as a result. And the more par paramagnetic it is, the more of that attraction it's going to feel. Now, on the other hand, what if all the electrons are all paired up? Well, if the electrons are all paired up, we would refer to it as being diamagnetic instead. Uh, and in this case, instead of experiencing a, uh, a slight attraction, it's going to experience a very, 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 very slight repulsion instead. So, but because all the electrons are paired up, there's no net spin, and that's why it's going to end up not having this paramagnetism associated with it. And so, uh, you're going to have to look at the number of d electrons, and you're going to have to fill them into one of these diagrams, depending on what kind of complex you're told you have, and just figure out, do I have unpaired electrons? Yes or no? If yes, well, then that's going to be a paramagnetic complex. And if no, well, then that's going to be a diamagnetic complex. And so by simply looking at the number of d electrons now and how they might fill in uh, on the type of complex you have, we now have a way of evaluating whether it's colored or whether it's going to be paramagnetic or diamagnetic. And those are the kind of questions we're going to answer here. Let's take a look. All right, so the first one we're going to take a look at here is SC3+. Plus. And first order of business is you just have to figure out how many d electrons we're dealing with. And so scandium is going to look like argon 4s to 3d1. So if you recall in the, in the crystal field theory lesson, we went right back over. We started off by figuring out electron configurations, reviewing it a little bit so we could figure out these number of d electrons. And this is definitely one of the examples we went over. So this is scandium, but scandium 3 plus, we're going to lose three electrons. Well, you lose the s's before the d's, but that's two that we have to lose for the s's and then one d. And all we're going to have left with is just plain old argon. 
And what this ultimately means is that scandium does not have any d electrons at all. And so in this case, if you had to choose, would you expect it more likely to be colored or colorless? Well, with no d electrons, no electrons that get promoted from the lower set to the upper set, we'd expect it to be colorless. And then paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Well, in this case, if you're isoelectronic to argon, a noble gas, where you've got a filled octet in that last shell and stuff like that, all the electrons are going to be paired. And so you're going to be, if I can spell this, diamagnetic. All right, so that's SC3+. Plus. Moving on to copper plus, and recall that copper is one of those lovely exceptions. And if we get the electron configuration now for copper, argon, and instead of 4s2, 3d9, you gotta remember that argon, I'm sorry, that copper is argon 4s1, 3d10. But again, we don't have copper. We have copper with a plus one charge. So we gotta remove one electron. And in this case, you gotta remember that you remove electrons from the 4s before the 3d. And so we're gonna lose that one electron right there and we're just gonna have argon 3d10. But the big deal here is that we have 10 d electrons. That's what we really need to figure out. Well, with 10 d electrons, these are all full. So I notice I didn't tell you if it was octahedral or tetrahedral. With 10 d electrons, you'd know it's not square planar because uh, this only exists for d8 complexes. So, but with 10 d electrons, it didn't matter if you fill in the octahedral or the tetrahedral, they're gonna be full either way. And if they're full either way, well, then there's no empty spots up here for the electrons down here to get promoted to. And so if I had to pick if it's more likely to be colored or colorless, I'm gonna pick colorless. And also, if we fill these in again, you'll see that regardless of whether it's octahedral or tetrahedral, they're all paired up all of them. And if there's no unpaired electrons, then we're going to expect it to be diamagnetic. All right, moving on to Fe2 plus here. And so Fe2 plus, and notice here I specified it's octahedral low spin. And notice I didn't specify that on the last ones here because with either zero electrons or 10 electrons, it wouldn't make a difference. But Fe2+, plus, it turns out, is going to end up being D6, and it's going to totally make a difference how you fill them in, whether it's tetrahedral, or whether it's octahedral and low spin, or octahedral and high spin. But with 60 electrons, it's, we'll find out, again, it can't be square planar. So we had but three options, so I had to tell you which of those three it was going to be. So let's figure this out, though. We've got, again, iron is argon, 4s2, 3d6, but we need to lose two electrons, and so again, you remove the s's before the d's, so it's just going to be argon 3d6. And so once again, the key here is that we've got six d electrons. That's the important part. And now we got to look and say, okay, because there's six d electrons, it's low spin octahedral. Let's fill those in. Well, let's take a look at what that looks like here. Let's empty these back up. Okay, so in this case, six electrons low spin means we fill up everything down low before we ever go up high. So this means we have a very large crystal field splitting energy, and so it's easier to pair the electrons up down low than to bump them up up high. So in this case, we filled in those 60 electrons, and we can see that, yeah, we'd totally expect this thing to be colored. But again, typically D1 to D9, you expect those things to be colored. Now, some of you might learn an exception for things that have five D electrons, and they're all unpaired, and so for one to promote it, we would have to switch its spin, which is a rare event. And if you learn that, well, great, then you're probably on the hook of that for that. But most of the rest of you, you're probably just going to learn about the, the two extremes, where if you're D0 or D10, probably colorless, D1 through D9, colored. If you've learned that D5 exception, I'll leave that to you, but not something most students are normally presented with at this level. Okay, so in this case, because it's D6, if I had to pick colored or colorless, I'm definitely picking colored. Got electrons down there that could get promoted up with the absorption of visible light. So we'd expect it to be colored. And then as far as paramagnetic, diamagnetic, I can see that all the electrons are paired, all of them. And so it's gonna end up being diamagnetic. All right, so our next example here is Fe2+. Plus. So, but instead of being uh, octahedral and low spin like the last example, it's now gonna be octahedral and high spin. Well, we already figured out that Fe2 plus was argon 3d6. We lost the two 4s electrons to become 2 plus. So same as the last example we did. So big thing again here is that it's 6d electrons. And having 6d electrons, 
So we'd expect it to be colored rather than colorless. So and if we fill in those in a high spin fashion here, we'll see why. So filling in 60 electrons, so one, two, three. And if we fill them in high spin, you go up high before pairing up anything down low. So four, five, and then six. And so now we got four electrons down here and I still have two empty spots up here to which they could go. And so yes, we'd expect it to be colored. And again, usually D1 to D9, uh, we expect it to be colored. Now, as far as paramagnetic or diamagnetic, we can see that we've got one, two, three, four unpaired electrons. This thing is very paramagnetic as a result. So Fe2 plus makes a really good comparison in this regard because as we saw with the Fe2 plus low spin, all the electrons were paired and it was diamagnetic. But with the Fe2 plus high spin, so we had four unpaired electrons and it ended up being paramagnetic instead. All right, CR3 plus. And so if we take a look at CR3 plus now and race our electrons here from the last example before we get started. So, but again, you gotta remember that chromium is one of your exceptions here. And so chromium is, electron configuration is argon, 4S1, 3D5. So instead of S2D4, it's S1D5. Promotes one from the 4S to the 3D to get them both half filled here. And now we gotta lose three electrons. Well, we're gonna lose that 4S electron first. And then we gotta take away two more to become 3D3. And notice this didn't say if it was low spin or high spin, it's because it didn't have to. You gotta have between four and seven uh, inclusive D electrons to have distinct low and high spin cases. So complexes, and so in this case with D3, whether you filled it in the low spin way or high spin way, it's gonna look exactly the same. And so it doesn't make a difference, so I didn't have to specify. And so in this case, we fill in 3D electrons, one, two, three, we see what that's gonna look like and whether this had been filled in the low spin way or the high spin way, it looks exactly the same for those first three electrons. And again, that's why it doesn't matter. But again, having D electrons but not being full, we expect it to be colored. We definitely have electrons in that lower set that can be promoted up to the higher set, empty spots. So, and then we see that we've got three unpaired electrons and so we'd expect it to be paramagnetic. All right, so last couple examples here on this question. Uh, so in this case, we're given an entire complex here and you gotta figure out, well, okay, there's six fluorines there, they're monodentate ligands, this has got a coordination number of six, so it's gotta be octahedral. They didn't tell you that it was octahedral, but from the formula of the complex, you can deduce that it's octahedral. But in this case, instead of saying high spin or low spin, I told you that F minus is weak field. Okay, so this is a little more challenging question, a little more things to, to figure out here. Well, first off, we gotta figure out what's the oxidation state of Fe here. Well, in this case, the, fluorine, the, the fluoro ligands are minus one each, and there's six of them for a total of minus six. So if the whole complex is minus three, then the iron here has to be in the plus three oxidation state. And so if we take a look at Fe plus three, recall that iron again is argon 4s2, 3D6, but if we're at Fe3+, we gotta lose three electrons. The first two we lose are the four S's, and then we'll lose one of the three D's. And so in this case, the big key is that this has five D electrons. Okay, now again, instead of being told it's low spin or high spin, you're told that it is weak field. So you gotta recall that weak field corresponds to a small crystal field splitting energy, which corresponds to a high spin. So weak field goes with high spin, strong field goes with low spin. So when you see weak field, you're supposed to think, oh, that's gonna be high spin. And so high spin, again, means we go up high before we pair anything up. And so there's your D5, and we got five unpaired electrons, and we can definitely see in this case that uh, that it's likely to be colored for most of you. However, it's not a given here that it's gonna be colored, it turns out. So, uh, but I'm gonna say colored, because that's how most of you are gonna have this presented. So, and in this case though, uh, with five unpaired electrons, it's definitely going to be highly paramagnetic. All right, last example here is nickel two plus in a square planar complex. And uh, in this case, if they tell you it's square planar, you should automatically know that it's going to be D8. So, but if we figure that out, so nickel is usually argon, 4S2, 3D8. 
and then we lose two electrons to become nickel two plus and lose the four s's and yet yeah, it's just argon three d8 so but square planar has to be a d8 and it has to fill in just like this for a square planar and so yes you're going to expect every square planar complex to be colored because you have electrons down here and you have an empty spot right up here it could go to So, but also if you fill in eight electrons on the square planar splitting pattern, they're all gonna get paired up every time. And so this guy's going to be diamagnetic. All right, so the last question we're gonna deal with is, which of these two lovely complexes is more likely to absorb blue light? All right, so if we take a look here, uh, in this case with FeCn6, four minus, you gotta realize that you've got iron in the plus two oxidation state. So each of the cyanides are minus one. And so iron must be plus two to get an overall minus four charge. And then FeH2O6, the aquas are neutral. So if it's gonna be plus two, it's all due to the iron, he's plus two. So we're dealing with Fe2 plus in both cases. And so in this case, the only way you can answer this question is if you are familiar with the spectrochemical series. And in this case, it's on the handout. I'm expecting you to look at this. I would just not ask this blindly. I would provide you with a brief spectrochemical series before asking you this question. And so the thing you gotta look at here is that cyanide is the highest ligand on the, the brief spectrochemical series I give you, which means it's gonna result in the largest splitting, crystal field splitting energy here between those. Whereas water's lower, and so this crystal field splitting energy associated with this complex is going to be smaller. Now in this case, I never said if it's high spin or low spin, so because I'm largely not going to care. So if we just fill this in, say one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So whether I fill them both in low spin, so well then the energy that's gonna get absorbed is again the crystal field splitting energy, the energy of the light that's gonna get absorbed. It's gonna to correspond to that energy in either case. So, and had I filled, say, this one in like, well, maybe this one's high spin because it's a smaller crystal field splitting energy. Well, maybe that's true. And it's still not going to matter because whether I go one, two, three, four, five, six. So the energy of the light that's gonna get absorbed is still gonna to correspond to exactly the, the same crystal field splitting energy. And so whether these are low spin or high spin in this example does not matter, it's totally irrelevant. So the big thing you're supposed to take away is if one of these is gonna absorb blue light, well, blue again is at the high end of the visible light spectrum. So I wanna pick the largest crystal field splitting energy. The energy of the light absorbs corresponds to that crystal field splitting energy. So, and in that case, therefore, I would pick FeCn6 four minus to be closer to the blue end of the spectrum for the light absorbed, I'd expect FeH2O6 to be closer to the red end of the spectrum for the light being absorbed. And again, I don't know that this is actually going to be blue light being absorbed, and I don't know that this is actually going to be red light being absorbed. It's just this one's closer to being at the blue end of the spectrum, and this one should be closer to being at the red end of the spectrum. And so oftentimes we just define the, the visible spectrum by its extremes, the, the blue end at the higher energy and the red end at the lower energy, that sort of thing. Cool, and that's exactly how that works with using that spectrochemical series. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a comment let me know are pretty much the best things you can do to support the channel. And I've got one chapter left in this playlist. It's gonna be an introduction to organic chemistry. And not all of you are gonna get there. So a lot of classes get to the end of the semester and they just don't have time. Uh, and some just even preemptively cut it off before we even get there. They don't even plan to cover it. So, but for some of you that are gonna include that chapter, I've covered it uh, next week. So if you wanna be notified, still subscribe to the channel and, and hit that bell notification. So, uh, but I'll, I'm not gonna wait too long before getting going on my next playlist. So, so you have, again, a choice between biochemistry, redoing physics, uh, or doing a freshman bio course, let me know in the comment section. Uh, I'll take your vote quite seriously. I'm not just trying to get comments here. Uh, and if you're studying for your final exams, take a look at my general chemistry master course. It includes final exam rapid reviews, practice final exams, if you're trying to do things quickly and efficiently. Free trial is available. I'll leave a link in the description below. Happy studying.